This is London Real. I am Brian Rose. My guest today is Victor Fisher, the investor, entrepreneur, and blockchain expert. You are the founder and CEO of Rockaway X, the digital assets investment firm focused on the growth of early stage blockchain startups and currently managing assets of $1.2 billion. You previously spent time as a junior partner at McKinsey, specializing in corporate finance and private equity. Then in 2004, you co-founded tech startup Innovatrix, the award-winning fingerprint recognition software company that was ranked in the Deloitte Top 50. Your mission is to support the Web3 pioneers of tomorrow by investing in and building the technology for a decentralized future. You believe crypto and blockchain represent a financial layer of the internet and bring transparency, freedom, and power to the people all over the world. You have said that the key to being a successful entrepreneur is determination and self-belief, something you hope to instill in the founders you work with. Victor, welcome to London Rail in Dubai. Thank you, Brian. Happy to be here. Great to have you here. You once said bull market means conferences, bear market means hackathons and research days. How do you know that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've been studying you. So where are we right now? What is the current state of the union in crypto? Yeah, I think we are in a very different cycle than previous cycles. And I've been around for, for two cycles already. And um, we are definitely in a crypto bull market. The sentiment is very, very positive within the crypto community. And uh, recently I asked ChatGPT to draw like a small picture of Crypto Spring. And, and if you look at my YouTube, like the picture is, it's amazingly right. Yeah, so it's like everything's green and blooming. However, that's the crypto sentiment. Then the TradFi sentiment and the retail, unlike was the case in, for example, 2021 or 2017, is not there yet. So on Coinbase, you know, it's, it's still not like a top one, two or three application in App Store. People are not really, I mean, normal, like retail people are not really trading crypto. And so I think we are in a very different state where it's a crypto people bull market, but normal people bear market still. Okay. And yet Bitcoin is almost added to your high. So does that tell you that this can go a lot further if and when that money joins us, including the TradFi money that might come in? <laughs> I think, so just to be a little bit more specific, I think the TradFi money is coming already in, but only to Bitcoin, thanks to the ETFs. And, uh, but the retail is not really investing in Bitcoin yet. You know, when I just took a taxi to come here, the driver is not speaking about, you know, investing into crypto or investing into Bitcoin. And so I think definitely, yes, we are going, we are definitely going much higher, higher than previous all time high, which I recall, if I recall correctly, was 69,000. Yeah. You know, when the taxi drivers are talking about it, it's usually the time to sell it, right? When yeah. your grandma's buying crypto, there's a lot of times the time to sell it. I remember I was in 1999, I was in New York City. I was the CFO of a dot-com startup and cab drivers were trading dot-com stocks. Back then. <laughs> so think of all the barriers to entry and that's yeah. still happening. And that was kind of the top. Yeah. So there are, there, are couple, there are a couple of more like um, signals, okay. which, which, I, which I try to take a look, look on. Some examples from 2021 is when my really good friends, you know, like normal people, tell me like, hey, Victor, what should I buy? That's the first question. And then I tell them, don't buy anything. <laughs> and they, then, then they say, I wanted to buy Eternium, but it's too expensive. So I'm going to buy Eternium Classic. <laughs> okay. And it's not even Eternium, it's Ethereum. And Ethereum Classic is like, you know, dying coin, which should not be around anymore. Right. And second signal, which I like to look at is the nightclubs. And how many, how many of the, of the tables where you have bottle service are bought by crypto people. And if you, for example, compare 2021 to 2022, when you go to some Miami conferences, like, uh, for example, Art Basel. And so the nightclubs in Miami were complaining in 2022 that no crypto people were there. So they couldn't sell out the bottle service. Okay. And it was the same thing in 2017. And early 18, if you remember the early 2018 Bitcoin conferences in Miami, also like sold out the nightclubs. That's also another signal, which I'll take, which I take a look at. And that means it's the top, that that's the, that's the top signal. Right. Yeah. When you get the text from old friends that aren't in crypto, 
Yeah. But then you have the second layer when now they're asking about yeah. specific coins and not the best coins. Yeah. That means they've educated themselves and looked into it. And that means it's time to sell. And there is a third signal, which I, which I like to look at, and it's crypto conferences, which are normally developers oriented, like Solana Breakpoint, where you don't have any more developers, but you have venture capitalists and you have, you know, people wearing Louis Vuitton and, um, off white, sh off white, um, shirts then it's also a sell signal. Okay, right. So when the dev conferences are no longer devs. Like Solana Breakpoint Conference in 2021, November, was like, Sol was at $250, $250. It was exactly the time to sell because now it's at 100. But when you go to Solana Breakpoint, like for example, I went to the one in November 2023, it was just developers. And, you know, Sol was trading at $30 maybe, it was, it was the right time to buy because there were developers, great community, people developing amazing applications on top of Solana, which could not be built on Ethereum, like for example, payments like Sling Money. That was the time to invest in November. Okay. What is your outlook on the future now? I mean, you, you have a lot of capital now that you deploy. I know you started small. I think it was like a six and a half million dollar fund, your first one and yeah. a carry didn't really employ anybody. <laughs> yeah. And you were like, man, this is hard. I mean, that was back as early as 15, 16 or something. Yeah. Okay. And now fast forward to 1.2 billion, you know, what is that like to grow so fast? Um, how do you stay humble? And then how do you separate things? Cause you, you have something very unique. And I attended one of your dinners in London a year ago, year and a half ago, you guys kind of have this new energy into what maybe is a traditional you know, business of managing funds, but you guys seem to be kind of scrappy, kind of crypto native, but also still mature enough to be in this kind of TradFi world. That's the yeah. vibe I get from Rockaway. Yes. So like we nearly went back bankrupt at the beginning because, uh, you know, I announced to all our investors like, hey, I am raising this 100 million fund and we got 6.5 million. <laughs> and then you basically, you know, management fees 2%. So 2% of, you know, 6.5 million, what is it? You know, like uh, one city salary, 130 K, like you cannot pay. Right. It's an analyst people. Okay. <laughs> exactly. And so, but we just basically, you know, didn't pay ourselves and we just kept grinding, grinding. And then what really helped us was to be really technology heavy. And so we started to build all the basically data centers, all the validator infrastructure. And we, for example, ran Solana validator from devnet to testnet to mainnet and now we have just our solana so all our validators together is around 800 billion dollars that we manage maybe a bit less 700 let's say and um and that gives you a return on that money yes that okay. gives you a return it's kind of a DeFi investment it's more in infrastructure okay Be because you really run the blockchains okay and so we are number one in terms of effectiveness of validating Ethereum globally. Wow. If you go on the rated.network, it's a dashboard to compare the effectiveness of all validators and we are number one globally. Wow. And now I, now I understand why our engineers sleep in data centers because we also buy the computers ourselves. So we don't run, you know, just uh, validation of Solana or Ethereum on um, Google Cloud or Amazon Cloud because we don't want also decentralized entities to then, you know, control the network or have a possibility to just switch it off, which is what happened, for example, with Hetzner. If you know Hetzner, it's a cloud provider in Germany and many of proof of stake networks. So blockchains were validated there, but they have in their terms of service, you should not be validating any blockchains. And so at one point they shut off all the, all the servers of Solana that were running there, that people were running in their data centers. And Solana lost 20% of their basically stake being validated. Yeah. 20% is not a problem. 33.3% is a problem because then you cannot produce any more blocks. And so that's why we fight against centralized entities and we run all the blockchains in our own data centers. And just to finish on your question. So that's how we basically, I think not only survive, but that's how also we now provide the value is that we are this, you know, very technical crypto natives on one hand and on the other hand also like this you know tradfi profiles mm. 
Very interesting. Which, you know, helped us to learn in our previous lives how to do corporate finance. So we're also very cautious. Okay. And so you, you own a lot of hardware then? Yes, we own a lot of hardware. That's not the easiest business to be in. But, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. And um, hardware just costs some amount of money and then you basically use it over several years. So you, you know, you just um, depreciate it over time. And, um, but I think that's the future of blockchains. Blockchains will, will always have to run on hardware, whether it's, you know, ASICs for Bitcoin, whether it's CPUs for proof of stake networks, whether it's GPUs in the future for zero knowledge, there always will be a part, important part, which is hardware. And I fight for the fact that it cannot be centralized on Amazon cloud. So the Bitcoin maxis, the first thing they'll point out about Ethereum is it's not truly decentralized because if, you know, Bezos has his kid kidnapped and they put a gun to his head, he'll turn it off and it's over. Now, maybe that's a bit of a generalization, but is this really what's needed? Do we really need more uh, individuals or individual companies to own hardware all around the world to make these things truly decentralized? And in your opinion, is Solana and Ethereum decentralized at this point? Yeah. And so I would say... Like, it's not like nobody knows, you know, what is like the concentration of Ethereum stake. And um, I'm hearing like lots of it is on Coinbase. I actually think, so Coinbase is a problem because they themselves, if you look for example on Cosmos Hub, so we developed a dashboard for decentralization because it's close to our heart. It's called Observatory. You go on observatory.zone, it's a website. You can see decentralization on all Cosmos chains. And so you look at Cosmos Hub because it's the main Cosmos chain. You know, the token is called Atom. And uh, nearly 10% of the entire chain, of the entire stake, is on Coinbase cloud. Coinbase is taking 20% fee. We take 8%, so it's much, much higher. Coinbase is missing some blocks. Coinbase is not participating to governance. And Coinbase is running on Amazon in Ireland on the cloud. And I think that's wrong. I think the e exchanges themselves should be, I think, a bit more pro decentralization and, uh, you know, run their own hardware in dedicated data centers. Hmm. Okay. And then, so how, how are Ethereum and Solana right now? In your mind, are they, are they decentralized or do they still have, you know, choke points? No, I think so. I couldn't imagine a situation where, you know, someone takes over, um, because you would have to calculate it, you know, like how many, so to take 33% of the entire Ethereum, Ethereum, let's say is right now at, what is it, 250, maybe $300 billion. Yeah. So we need $100 billion of money to basically take over Ethereum. For Bitcoin, like I would have to do some calculations. I don't know what it is right now to take over like, you know, that amount of hash rate. Uh, Solana is uh, it's a 60 billion valuation, take over one third you know, like $20 billion. So from that perspective, you know, it's difficult, I would say, to take over a chain. But I would say, I don't have a problem of running in data centers. I think, you know, just like software currently, most of it is run on data centers. I have a problem if blockchains run on, you know, centralized uh, cloud providers like uh, Amazon, Google, or, um, you know, Hetzner, for example, OVH because they might um, censor it or stop it. Yeah, well, you know better about, more about this than me. I do. <laughs> I know about censorship of my media, but it's yeah. interesting, you can censor money as well. Maybe even more dangerous when you censor money, because it's an it's a ama amazing method of control. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I appreciate that you're doing that, <laughs> very much so. Um, talking about Solana, because you're heavily invested in Solana, and I've never spoke to the CEO of Solana, and I was wondering if you could tell me about your journey with that blockchain. We almost thought it was dead after FTX. I mean, we really did. The price now is at 100, but it was down in 20s or maybe less at one point. Yeah. Um, and now it's come roaring back. At one point, I think it was ahead of BNB BM, smart chain, and then it was fighting for number four or five. And now you say it's the network to build on for financial tools, I believe. Yeah. Um, tell me about Solana in your mind, because a lot of people don't know enough about it, or they know it as an NFT provider, you know, back in 21. Yeah. And so we invested in Solana in March, 2018. 
Okay. March 2018 at the pre, uh, the pre-sale token. Yeah, of course. Like before anybody knew that it actually existed. Four cents, the April 18 was the pre-sale token, according to the blockchain, I think. Um, well, you had two tranches. Okay. You had a three cent and a 20 cent. And then depending on like how well you negotiate it, you got a blend of the two. Okay. And so, but price doesn't matter. What matters is it was an amazing team. So we went to 500 startups incubator in San Francisco. That's where they all worked. And we met with Raj and we discussed and, and I really liked their vision. Already then it was focused on just one thing to do the fastest blockchain. And then, you know, Raj back then had a position of COO, I believe. And I told him, look, like before we invest, we really like your vision, but before we invest, we'd like to talk to the CEO, which was Anatoly. But Anatoly was just coding with his, you know, ex-colleagues of, um, of his previous company, Qualcomm. Right. And he didn't even want to talk to us. And this is for me a great signal. <laughs> because when there is clear vision and only one thing they want to achieve, number one, and number two, they eliminate everything else, you know, even talking to VCs and just being focused on one thing. For me, it was, of course, like we, we beg this company. We have to, we have to beg this team. Wow. I love that. And, uh, and what I really like about them is like nothing went well for Solana since the beginning. So, you know, they started building in 17 and started to do their fundraising 18 in March when everything crashed and Basically, they, they, they are against the cycle, yeah? So then they released, um, you know, their blockchain in 2021 and then just went, you know, it just went through the roof immediately. Of course, it was very fast for some reason, overhyped, but it's because they were hitting, you know, the, the bull market of 2021. And they had the speed that Ethereum was lacking that time, at that time. Yes, of course. And, uh, but, of, but also because, you know, retail was coming in and everybody saw Solana as, a, as like the blockchain to, to base or the token to hold. But interestingly, Sol token had a value of over $100 all, only for four months. So really like a super quick boom and then super quick bust. Okay. And, um, and then it went all the way down to, I think $20, maybe even $8 with um, the FTX and because um, FTX was heavily invested and or promoting Solana. I, I think both. So, yeah. and even building on top of Solana, um, some like early DeFi protocols. And so, and so the team just didn't give up and always continued on their own only vision, which was like to do the fastest blockchain globally. And, um, and that's why, you know, we always supported them. We even, um, sponsored the Solana Breakpoint conference because we knew that it was tough for them to find, to find sponsors. And right now, you know, here they are when the, the most important for me is to use the products of our portfolio companies. We have 50 portfolio companies and 30 funds and Solana is still the number one product out there. You know, you connect with your Phantom or your backpack wallet. I was just using it yesterday. And, um, it's, it's my birthday in two days. I actually booked, uh, I booked a small boat, uh, to take for the 14th of February for the whole day with my girlfriend and I paid with USDC on Solana. It was such an easy experience. Even the provider, the vendor of the boat, he said, we love blockchains. It's just so easy. And he haven't heard about Solana back then. And so I introduced him to Solana, send him, you know, whatever is the amount in USDT and, you know, he's happy. So you could, even though he hadn't heard of Solana, you could send him USDC on the Solana network or from the Solana wallet. Yes, he was proposing me Tron or okay. ERC20, so TR20 or ERC20. Okay. But I told him, look in your, look at your provider. You should also be able to accept Solana. And then he said, yes, I can. Is this the address? Then I checked the address on SolScan. It was a Solana address. There was no money. I just sent him $100 to see if it would work. And then he, he said, yes, I can see it in my app. Then we just use Solana. Okay. Got it. Was that, that was a wallet. That wasn't like MetaMask or something. MetaMask probably doesn't, doesn't support Solana. MetaMask doesn't. Okay. I don't know what he used on his end. Okay. But I used the Phantom wallet. Okay. And Phantom on Solana, you have two good wallets. It's Backpack and Phantom. 
and I used Phantom Wallet, sent it to him through Phantom. And then you can see the transaction on SoulScan, super easy, okay. super easy. I think I have a Phantom Wallet, but I haven't used Solana much yet, um, and I wasn't using it for NFTs back in the day. But um, it's got a special place in my heart. I'm from San Diego, so Qualcomm was massive there when I was growing up. I think my brother worked for Qualcomm when he was in high school as a computer scientist. Um, I live literally like 10 miles from Solana Beach. Yeah. So I know where Solana <laughs> comes from. I still never got an airdrop. So, you know, maybe we can chase that up with CEO. But um, they don't do airdrops, but maybe you should look at some applications being built on Solana. Yeah. There's some really exciting things like, um, for example, Camino Finance. I think it's like the one of the best DeFi protocols on Solana. And they allow you to generate yield. So you have some USDC. You can lock it in a pool and they, they provide liquidity into different like decentralized exchanges, for example, like Orca to generate yield, or you can borrow against your soul through through Camino Finance. I'm using Camino Finance myself to provide liquidity in a in a pool called uh, M Sol Gito Sol. So I liquid stake my soul and put it in that pool. And and you know, Solana inflation is six percent per year. This pool generates two percent per year. So it's like, it's interesting. Okay. And it's like fully liquid. You can take it out. You can then exchange it for like dollars and then use it. Another example I could tell you as a creator is um, Helio platform. So Helio is a payment platform for creators. Imagine you are a trader, you have a trading view set of signals and you can just create a payment link on Helio. People just click and then they send you USDC. Immediately you get it on your Helio wallet, which is Solana, very neat interface. You can sell videos. So you upload video onto Helion platform and for every minute that people watch, you can get some dollars. You can charge for pictures. It's basically a payment gateway, super simple to, to use, easy graphical interface. We generates payment links for your fans to click and for you to earn money. Okay. So in 21, when I dove headfirst into this entire ecosystem, after I lost the race for mayor of London. So it was like May 6th and I went all into crypto. We created a crypto and DeFi Academy. We created London Real Ventures. And then I started having the top 100 people on the show. And because back then I had 2.4 million YouTube subscribers, everybody said yes. So I had um, Emin from, from uh, AVAX on and John Wu. I had the Hedera people on, I had Justin Sun on. I had anybody I could talk to, to talk about their layer ones. And I called it the layer one wars because it was all kicking off. and. People were fighting for market share. I didn't get to talk to the Solana guys, but I'm sure I will at some point. And everyone concluded that maybe there would be a handful of them in the future and each one would specialize. There might be a financial services, there might be a gaming, there might be this, there might be that, based on choice or maybe just users or whatever. How do you think the future of layer ones is gonna play out? Now we have layer twos, now we have CKs, but do you think something like that will happen where some of these layer ones will specialize in one thing or the other? You know, we've seen AVAX now used in some games, I know they were always trying to pitch it for financial services, but like, what do you think we are right now in those top layer ones? I think the only thing that only two ecosystems that matter and it's Ethereum and Solana, everything else it's secondary. But when I say Ethereum, I, I mean, ev even EVM compatible chains make sense. And, um, I'm also excited by new kind of, um, I would say mixed chains where you have, for example, Monad. Monad is building a full layer one with a parallel EVM. So you can program in Solidity, but actually you can program an application which will be execute, which will have its threads executing in parallel versus just sequential like current EVM. Okay. Why I think EVM is important is because of all the moat or because of all the ecosystem and all the liquidity. You know, what is it now? $60 billion of TVL locked into the, the Ethereum ecosystem. That's a lot. And I think blockchains are like planets, you know, like people exchange or like Hasi from Dragonfly saying they're like cities. So people like to, you know, just exchange between themselves within one ecosystem. Now, Ethereum still has problems. For example, it's fragmentation of uh, different interfaces or layer tools, if I can call it like this which means with your MetaMask, if you connect, you have to choose which chain to connect to. Like imagine with your phone, if you were calling your mom or your dad, you would have to choose a different network. 
makes no sense. So there has to be chain abstraction, which needs to come on Ethereum. I think it's just a matter of time. They are working on it. Um, there is a technical solution to it, but you know, it's a separate discussion. So that way I can log in with, uh, with Polygon or any of those other layer twos or compatible layer one EVMs and they'll all work. You just open the wallet right. and you don't even know which chain you're interacting. We're going to tell our grandkids one day that back in, <laughs> back in our day, we had to choose a, a chain and they'll be like, oh, come on. Yes. It's come crazy. on, grandpa. That's silly. Crazy. Right. I know like, we have to do that now. Like the fact that you just open your MetaMask and you see USDC on, um, on Arbitrum and USDC on Optimism and USDC on layer one, like it's crazy. Yeah, but it's crazy. But a year ago, you wouldn't even see some of those. No, but everything, everything they would be, be hidden. Everything would be slow. Yeah. But now, you know, on, on the Arbitrum and Optimism is relatively fast. Okay. Yeah. All right. And so Emin Gunsir in Brooklyn right now is rolling over in his, in his, in his bed because you just said he's not relevant. But, you know, uh, these other Avalanche is EVM compatible. It is. Yeah. Okay. So they get a pass. All right. So there's a few that will then survive as EVM compatible. Yes. But otherwise, within the ecosystem, I think, you know, Ethereum has to incorporate a sequencer on their chain. And then all the basically uh, requests have to come down, have to come through like one sequencer. And then that sequencer then has to, you know, ask different chains to execute the transaction. Mm. Then the transactions data need to be settled outside of Ethereum layer one. So today it's called data availability, very bad name settled either on L1 or on Celestia. In the future, I think it will be settled on Eigenlayer DA, Eigen DA, maybe Polygon Avile, maybe ideally Ethereum itself, because I think Ethereum, well, they already have it on the, on the roadmap. It's called Dang Sharding. They should have this data availability or temporary data storage also on their chain. And then the settlement will be on Ethereum L1. So I think right now, just to conclude my thoughts, right now in Ethereum, we are in a world where to make everything more efficient, we are breaking it apart. And ultimately, I think within Ethereum development is still slow. So let's say within five years, so not this cycle, but next cycle, we'll have Ethereum, which will incorporate all of those applications, which are now being, you know, just modularized or created elsewhere. So I think in the future, Ethereum will have its own sequencer, it will have its own data availability as well. And then we come back to, you know, just basically one integrated solution. Okay. All right. And so it's ultimately about network effect. Like you said, it's got the most TVL. It's also got the most developers. Yeah. And so in that sense, it will probably win. Um, well, I also said Solana. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, but I think it's also because like people are belief based and which chain they transact on, it's also a bit of a religion. And so that's why I think Solana is important because Solana has a big ecosystem right now and um, it has a clear value proposition that is the fastest chain and most user-friendly. And I actually also think Bitcoin is important because Bitcoin is now, what, $900 billion? It's three times Ethereum. That's a big planet. And there is not much you can do with it, but just basically hold it. Some people th think it's a feature. I think we could do more with Bitcoin. So I'm also excited about Bitcoin utility. Okay, let's jump there because we were just at Satoshi Roundtable yeah. for four or five days. It was an amazing event. Shout out to Bruce Fenton, who was actually here in that chair yeah. right before it. Um, it was about 450 invite only of some of the probably og in cryptos out there. These are people you won't see at conferences. These are people who don't take pictures and a lot of the people in the ecosystem. I really enjoyed it. I quite enjoyed the, um, the talks every single day. There were like these impromptu lectures, arguments, discussions that happened all over the Waldorf, which we took over on the Palm. And uh, and I really enjoyed a lot, but I would say, maybe I'm wrong, but it felt like 20% of those were about Bitcoin and building on Bitcoin, DeFi on Bitcoin, BRC20, all these things that are happening. And uh, we've got a few investments in that space. And I was really curious to learn. What I actually realized is how little people have been able to do on that ecosystem. It's still very nascent. There's things happening, but it's, you know, it's obviously not built to be a smart contract and they're trying to hack into it and make it a smart contract. What are your thoughts on the future? Will there be DeFi on Bitcoin? 
I also met Dan Held, who's an OG Bitcoiner, and he literally is starting his own fund that only does DeFi on Bitcoin. So what do you think about that network? Um, ordinals have exploded. I think they're doing more volume than NFT. In 2023, yeah, yeah. In Ethereum. Most of volume. Right. Um, so yeah, w w what is going to happen with Bitcoin? Yeah. Like, look, like, I'm super excited. And we could see it at Satoshi Roundtable. Like, the best discussions were, like, the layer twos on Bitcoin, that was the talk, originally, you know, suggested by Muni, which is, like, the founder of Stacks. Yeah. But then you had Muni there, you had Alex from Bob, built on Bitcoin. You had, um, you know, other founders, like QED Protocol, which are trying to do zero knowledge, uh, base layer two on top of Bitcoin. And then you had Litecoin. And so, and so the discussion was so interesting because I also organized this Bitcoin Builders Unparty. I don't know if you if you noticed that, but um, but the first day um, we organized in my room on the fifth floor, like Bitcoin Builders Unparty. Eighty people showed up. Was that the two rooms you put together? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. that was the two rooms we put together. <laughs> we opened the door in the middle. We called it bridge. <laughs> Because normally you don't do bridges if you're a Bitcoiner because you're like just one world apart. And uh, some people were telling me, Victor, you are not afraid of like saying openly, because I invited everyone at the opening speech of the of the conference. I said, hey, like we are doing this un, un party in this room, you know, please come starting 9 p.m. And then we were afraid like Bitcoin Maxis would chase us. <laughs> and actually it didn't happen. Like it was fantastic conversation. And I'm so excited about, you know, as I said, like build on Bitcoin. So Bob, Botanix, Mezzo, just super interesting three protocols. Everything ZK related, QED, you know, so much excitement. How far away from having DeFi on Bitcoin? I think two years out. That long? Yeah. Because it's so complicated to build it and the layer twos aren't ready yet. Well, well the layer twos will be launched this year. Yeah. So until then, there are def DeFi applications on top of them. I think it's one more year. So two years. Okay. Okay. Will we get anybody to do something on the blockchain itself with like BRC20? Uh, or is that too unstable in your opinion? Uh, I think it's difficult. I think uh, we need layer tools. Okay. Uh, I think but you're super excited about it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's the largest ecosystem. And as I said, you know, it's a huge planet and people they like to transact between each other within that one planet. Going to another planet to do something else, it's like, you know, taking a rocket to go from Earth to Mars if you want to do another transaction. And so that's why, like, I'm very excited. Okay, let's contrast B BTC with Solana. The criticism Solana gets is it's not decentralized. They used to say all the nodes were controlled by, I don't know, Andreessen or whoever. I don't know if that's true. And it goes down. The network goes down sometimes. What would you say to those people? And again, as a contrast to Bitcoin, obviously it's got some perks over Bitcoin, but that's the criticism Solana gets. Maybe there's other criticisms you can tell me too. Um, what do you say about those? What are your thoughts on those? So I would say, I would say it is decentralized. It's running on 2000 validators. And, um, you know, if you look at them, I think it's maybe like 200 of them, which have more than 33% of the network which is much more decentralized than some, for example, Cosmos networks. If you look at you know, Cosmos Hub itself or even DYDX, you know, it's maybe 10 validators having 33% of the network. And so, yes, it is decentralized, number one. Number two, unfortunately, sometimes it goes down, but it's still in beta stage. And last time it went down was, I think, last week. And... And the time before was last February, 2023. So, you know, once per year for four hours, even Facebook or Google or WhatsApp sometimes go down. And I would argue, you know, it's maybe even more than once per year. I haven't looked at statistics, but I think it's normal in this complex software world. Now, what happened this year is that um, there was a bug which was already found in a testnet and corrected in a testnet but somehow it was executed on the mainnet and that's why the chain stopped producing blocks. We are actually one of the main validators of the Solana blockchain. Also, we were on Discord orchestrating the restart. How is the restart done? Is that you choose a snapshot, like a blockchain at one point of time in the history. The snapshot is 60 gigabytes. Then we 
hosted those 60 gig- gigabytes on our servers, gave access to everybody, all the validators. They have to download the 60 gigabytes. So at one point we were uploading like 10 gigabytes per second because the whole world was downloading the snapshot from our servers. And then they put the snapshot on their servers and then you have to wait until 80% of stake is, is up and running, which takes four hours until you know the timing is right throughout all the time zones globally. Because now, you know, we had to wait until the West Coast in the US wakes up. Okay. A little messy, huh? The East, East are going to come after you on that. And the financial people are going to say, wait a second, this is down. And the gamers are going to say, we need our network. Well, I think four hours, I think we can, we can get it down to one hour if we have like better processes internally to restart the validator network. Solana Labs is not involved because they are developing the chain. But to restart the chain, you have to have a coordination of validators. And I think we have to do a better job there because it's still a bit, you know, there is one document which is prepared with all the instructions and that document is not updated and it's a bit of a mess. So from my TreadFi experience, I know we can do processes better. And then, of course, just the blockchain will get more stable with time. The Lind effect. Right. More time, the better it gets, like <laughs> life. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, let's talk about yield. Cause I know you have kind of areas that you invest in. I know DeFi is one of them. I know you have investors that want yield. TriFi loves yield. Um, we used to see back in 21, you know, amazing yields, 8% on USDC, then 18% on the USD. Uh, and then they all crashed down below what you could get in the treasury market. Now, another thing that people were talking about at Satoshi was liquid staking, Eigenlayer, some of these new exciting ways where you can take your four or four and a half percent Ethereum staking yield and get an extra two or three or four or eight, depending on what you want to do with your risk. Um, maybe 20 max they're seeing on Eigens, although that seems to be a little toppy. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts? Is this exciting? It seems kind of exciting to me. Um, I come from kind of fixed income derivatives. Yep. And so um, what are your thoughts on that? Obviously, Eigenlayer is a big talk. You know, there's rumors it's going to be a $20 billion protocol already making their investors a lot of money. We're seeing some dApps on that that are already blowing up as they launch. So what are your thoughts? What does Rockaway think of these exciting things? So we are very excited about the yield. We think it's a very strong value proposition of blockchains. It was the case in 2021 when real interest rates were negative. And we could have, you know, at one point, because we have a, we have a fixed income product, we have a fixed income yield fund, it's a market neutral hedge fund based in Liechtenstein, fully regulated in EU. And so we were generating 20, 25, 30% back in 2021. And uh, wow, there was some Terra Luna in there to help. Well, what, what was the, what was the anchors yield? It was 20%, no? Yeah, 18, 20, something like that. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. yeah, anchors yield was 20%. So yes, we had, uh, we had, we had, I think $8 million in Anchor that we removed when the unpack was happening. And, um, but the bottom line is people love yield. And so, but I still split the yield in two categories. One is yield on USD, on, on dollar. It is very difficult right now to have a strong product on the blockchains. Because like you say, in TreadFi, investors generate, you know, four or 5% risk-free I just met with an investor here in Dubai. They're saying they can they can do thirteen percent lending to, you know, a good TreadFi company generating four hundred million dollars per year of positive EBITDA. It's it's uncollateralized lending, but with such a you know PNL and a good balance sheet, they you know they they can borrow and they offer investors thirteen percent. Thirteen. Thirteen. Now we generated on our fixed income lending product 13.6 last year. That's not good enough for TreadFi investors. They prefer staying in their TreadFi world, having 13% with risks they understand. In our world, they don't understand the risks. I think this can change uh, in a bull market where when we provide liquidity to DeFi protocols, we earn underlying yield, but also tokens on top. Think of it as, you know, you are providing venture debt and you get warrants on top. And so with this, I think we could achieve, you know, the 20, 25, maybe the 30%. Then might be interesting for TreadFi. But I think we are not there yet. 
in DeFi. On the other hand, generating yield on native assets, that's very exciting. But that's for crypto native people because they own a lot of SOL, they own a lot of ETH, and they own a lot of Bitcoin. And they would like to generate more, more yield on this. Look at, for example, Blast. Have you heard about Blast? No. Blast is an L2 on Ethereum. It doesn't do anything, but if you put your ETH there, it stakes and it generates staking yield for you and gives you points. So then you will earn also Blast tokens once they are released. And there was like a huge amount of Ethereum which was bridged to Blast protocol. Although it's not secure because it's just a multi-sig. So basically like a team can now take your ETH and maybe run away with it, yeah? <laughs> and and so these native assets are really searching for yield. I am against speculative yield generated on airdrops. I like real yield. I'm, for example, excited by insurance where you could use your native Bitcoin or Ethereum or Sol to actually reinsure some insurance. So um, Realm as a company is one of the top insurance providers for crypto because you know, AXA would not insure you if you are managing a fund and you need directors and officers insurance, but Realm would. Now Realm has so much demand that they would like to reinsure some of it. The best way how to reinsure it is through a DeFi protocol. You lock your ETH, you give it to them, they use it for reinsurance. Yeah? I'm excited by, th by those uses. Is that happening yet? Not yet. I hope soon. Okay. Okay. So, and, and let me just understand that this is an important point is that when people are promising you yields and there's no risk to, to give you that reward, you're suspicious because that's going to end in tears, right? That is kind of a, you know, multi-layer marketing Ponzi type scheme. But if there's real risks that someone's taking on to get that yield, you're a believer. So if I'm insuring or if I'm doing, maybe doing some of the liquid staking, which we'll talk about, then I do deserve that extra few percent. And you're excited about those. Yeah, protocols. actually, I'm not excited about airdrops okay. or you know, tokens for free or right. yield for free. Yeah. Because I think, I think it's just speculation. It's unsustainable. It's unsustainable. There is no real, you know, value behind it. If the yield comes from, you know, a real value like reinsurance, and there, yes, you are taking additional risk because you are insuring, but it generates additional yield, additional, I don't know, 10, 10%, then it's great. Okay. So I'm, I'm all for a year real yield. What about Eigenlayer? There was a group that I went to uh, by the pool. There was only about four people there. This probably tells you. And the, the topic was, uh, is this another financial crisis waiting to happen? So yield on top of yield on top of yields. And what are we going to do about it? Of course, no one showed up because maybe there's no nobody developing this. But it was an interesting discussion, and I didn't know if it was warranted, but they said, look, you're staking your ETH, and then now you're taking the same ETH, and it's collateralizing something else, and you're just dialing up your risk profile. Um, isn't everybody aware that this reminds us of something that's happened before? Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? So I like very much Eigenlayer as a company because they are providing the risk-taking layer, but also creating a data availability layer, which I already said, you know, like a part, like a separate blockchain where you store data to make Ethereum even faster. And then you can actually use your ETH, give it to Eigenlayer to secure this EigenDA layer. And so why I like it is because it provides, like you say, additional yield on your ETH or on your staked ETH. Now it will be very important to choose the right AVSs. So AVS is a short name for the services that your staked Ethereum within Eigenlayer will insure. And the AVSs will be run by operators like us. You know, you are a validator, then you can run an Eigenlayer operator and you choose a mix, either one or a mix of AVSs you want to secure with people's yield. And there I think a uh, very well thought through risk management needs to be done on the operator level to make sure that they are not just basically using AVSs with fully correlated risks. Because then if something happens here, then could finish like a domino. And um, that's why we are now working closely with Eigenlayer and also some liquid restaking protocols on top of Eigenlayer to make sure that just like we did the dashboards for decentralization, 
there will be dashboards for risk management. Okay. But will we start to see 10, 12% yield as something that anybody can tap into thanks to eigenlayer and liquid restaking in say the next three months, six months? No, because eigenlayer will be launched in Q3 this year. So it will take some time until they will be able to incorporate some, some AVSs. And um, what will be the yield on top? I don't know, it's Ethereum's yielding three, four percent. If you put MEV on top, if you are, you know, using some validator who who has MEV boost from flashbots, you can achieve, you know, five percent. Now to put ten percent on top of it, I don't think it's possible. I think maybe three, four percent, but even that is good enough for uh, for crypto people. That gets you to ten, twelve, yeah, mm -hmm. eight, ten percent. Okay. And th I think anything above ten is just sounds crazy. Okay. I would want to double click on it to see where the yield come, comes and it from. Won't come bring in chat fies until the Fed starts dropping rates, which will probably happen this year. But I'll hope so. But maybe the long term rates won't drop. So TradFi won't be playing with this, but crypto natives will. Yes. Okay. Okay. And and same thing on the on the yield on USD. I don't think it's for TradFi, but but we have really good discussions with, for example, foundations who are holding stable coins. They don't want to off ramp it to the old world. But they would like to generate generate yield. When will stable coins start paying yield? I mean, Tether just announced two point eight billion dollars in profits. I think it was um, it was point two over the whole the whole, okay. year, the whole year. So they they keep the yield. I mean, I traded treasuries for a long time. When I own treasury yeah. bonds, I got the coupon too. Yeah, and so they keep the yield in one pocket, and then they give you an asset that tracks the dollar. Um, do you think those will start paying out yield in the future? I think there are. Okay, there are companies like Mountain Protocol or Midas, which are generating yield through US treasuries and passing it on to you. And then there are companies like Ethina who are generating yield through basis trade, through futures, and they are passing this trade on to you. That's another, I think, very risky value proposition going forward, because if, if Ethina has 100 billion of issued stablecoin, then you basically have to generate, you know, then you have $100 billion to generate basis yield, basis trade on. And, you know, basis trade is sometimes giving 5%, sometimes 10%. So to generate $10 billion through basis trade will be a lot of volume. You don't have so many exchanges to be able to do options today. It's mainly Deribit. And so Deribit is actually invested in Athena. But I think it could really um, drive up the volumes of Deribit and then Maybe even, like, I don't know what's going to happen because the market makers will know that, that Athena is a big, basically, basis trade um, author of the yield on top of that. Even they could trade against it. So I'm also a bit worried where we are going in this, you know, hunt for yield. But bottom line is there are already stable coins generating yield. Okay. As a, as a person who lived through Terra Luna and who at one point was getting 18, 20% yields, I think you said you had $8 million in there. You got it out before it crashed. What, what were you thinking at the time as far as where this yield was coming from? And now in retrospect, what were your thoughts on what happened? Would you do it again? Yeah, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, um, Anchor Protocol was not giving you real yield. Anchor Protocol was giving you basically yield in their own tokens. They were just issuing new tokens. This is exactly the yield I don't want to talk about in this cycle because this is you know the paper money this is like imagine you invested into a company which was just issuing new shares right to attract more people of course it works but at one point it stops working because you can only issue that many new shares and then diluting everybody else and um and the problem was actually on the ust side because you know in order to pack the ust you had to issue more runa and so it was also just, you know, basically a temporary, uh, like you had, you had these risks that, but everybody knew about. Actually, during the Formula One weekend, when the DPEG happened, I was in the US, I was in Miami, I was discussing with people and like people were asking me, are you also just like US hedge funds doing the most popular trade right now, which is shorting Luna? It was known, like it was known that this is a risk. And then, you know, the whole attack came uh, during the weekend of Formula One. And um, my developers in Prague, we are running risk dashboards on all our positions. 
they called me. It was 1 a.m. for them. For me, it was like 3 p.m. And they were like, Victor, there is UST Unpeg. We have $8 million there. If we sell it now, it's $80,000 hit. Do we sell it? And I said immediately, yes, just sell everything. A 1% hit. Whatever that yeah. Was. yeah. Okay. You can like, you can stomach 1% hit, especially if, you know, your fund is generating, back then it was 20% per year, yeah? But you cannot stomach, you know, back then our fund was what, like um, $50 million? If you lose $8 million or $50 million, like you are dead on a fixed income product, as you know, yeah? Yeah. And so we exited the, the, the UST immediately. And many didn't, though. Unfortunately, I think mostly retail didn't. Yeah. Because it was very well-known hedge fund trade. Yeah. I think also some retail knew, but they just didn't want to take a cut. They didn't want to take a, maybe not a 1%, but a 3% or a 5% because they looked at it as a fixed income. I get my principal back. Yeah. And then they watched it, you know. Look, like, I don't want to sound too smart. I had my own money in Anchor, in UST, and in Luna, I didn't exit anything. Okay. And so it's also a lesson for me as a fund manager. It's very difficult to do both, like, fund trades and your personal trades. And so I highly discourage all fund managers to also kind of like be big degen on a side. I think small degen is important because that's how you know what's new and you can, you have basically play with new protocols, but it's very difficult to think about your personal portfolio and your fund portfolio at the same time. Yeah. I worked when I worked 15 years of financial services, I never, I never traded my, my personal portfolio. Yeah. So I just didn't have the bandwidth for it. I had to have all the bandwidth. Yeah. You're so tired, you don't want to be thinking about more risk on top yeah. of the risk you're trying to manage and you can't sleep anyways yeah. if you've got overnight positions and just like, I don't need to worry about my equity portfolio on top of that. Yeah. It's psychologically just so difficult. What about that attack? I mean, I don't know if it was Citadel or whoever, but they, they squeezed that like all great hedge funds do. And I had to kind of educate some people that this is just business as usual and in, you know, the greater New York area. You know, what is the gray line from the movie Wall Street? When Bud Fox says, you know, Gordon, why did you wreck this company? Talking about his father's Blue Star Airlines. And he says, because it's wreckable. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people think they did a bad thing, but that's how the world works. And yeah. those people saw an opportunity to squeeze something just like Soros did with the UK government when they, when they de-pegged the pound. Yeah. What did you make of that? And do we need to be wary of that in the future that somebody like Citadel comes in and sees a tasty little eigen layer you know, poor risk management and squeezes that, that's yeah. going to happen in the next couple of years. Look, I, I really struggle with that because, um, like we are like, we are in this industry of crypto because it's freedom. Now anybody anywhere in the world can do like transaction services. And, um, you know, my father is a teacher, my mother is a teacher. So for me doing venture capitalist means basically it just means teaching the founders, how not to do the same mistakes like we did when we were younger kids. And so I think we are pretty good in the venture capital stage, but in crypto, the venture capital very quickly transforms into a publicly traded company with a token release. And you release the token by definition very early because you need it for the mainnet. So you release it before you have traction on general, which is way too early, but you have to from technical perspective. And so this is what I struggle with is that then in a second stage of the company, it becomes a publicly traded startup. And, and to be honest, like we had to learn that we had to hire new type of people, which are quant traders. The quant traders are working in our hedge fund, but they're actually thinking of a different brain with completely different brain than the venture capital guys. Venture capital guys are trying to help the entrepreneur to build a big company. And the quant traders are telling us now that it's public. How are people looking at it? With my heart, I'm definitely the venture, like the venture builder type of guy. I but, struggle with it. But you have the quant traders yeah. as part of your business. Yeah. And sometimes their job is to bet against companies. But we don't do that. It's more like um, their job is to generate yield in a market neutral way. And their job is to tell us so like, what is the risks that are coming? Um, now, of course, we sell some of our positions. We never short, we just sell some of our positions, which we have through the venture capital business. The decision to sell is very difficult. It takes more time than decision to invest because people fall in love with the founders. They fall in love with the company because you're working so closely. 
and then you're basically telling them throughout the years, we are long-term investors, long-term investors, and then you sell. It's a very difficult decision, but we had to learn it. And sometimes you have to do it. You have to do it because you have to reimburse capital to your investors. We are in a money business. Another line from Gordon Gecko says, Christmas is over and business is business. Yeah. I think, by the way, the movie Wall Street teaches you everything you need to know about life. Yeah. If you watch it enough times, which I clearly have. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll have to watch it tonight. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so you have that trading side. Tell me what is it like to manage a group of token traders in that kind of quant fund versus TradFi traders? Because it's a very different world being in the token world. Also with all the knowledge that you have. Um, versus, say, people that are stocks or any other typical kind of a hedge fund. Yeah. I never worked in a TradFi hedge fund industry, but how to manage them is actually, so we have uh, market calls between our teams where our VC team and our hedge fund team get together and they exchange ideas on the market. Very exciting conversations. And you can see it's like two different brains working completely differently. Yeah. And so the, the venture capital guys are like, for example, like... Hey, like this is a new technological innovation and, uh, you know, we have to be involved. And then the hedge fund guys are like, but it's just a money grab. Yeah. Like there is no substance. And so it's very difficult to see and, and to contrast the two, the two mindsets. One is very long-term, one is very short-term. Right. Cause and I still a... struggle with that. Like I'm, I'm more, as I said, like the venture capital guy. Right. But if it is a money grab, then you, you do want to be short-term long in yeah. those things. Right? And that's my problem right now is that many of the things that we see could be seen as money grabs, like, you know, Dimension, for example. Dimension is a new blockchain. It's a new layer two. Nobody's using it because it's very new. 7.5 billion valuation. Celestia, 20 billion valuation. You know, of course, it's a great idea but ultimately will be incorporated within Ethereum. So do you do such a temporary trade? Yeah. Like there are so many like very difficult questions and that's my worry for this year of the crypto market is that, is that, you know, we have all of these super high valuations like Dimension, Celestia and, 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 and others because only 10% of the tokens were released at the token launch but all the unlocks are coming. The unlock schedules that I see right now are four years. So one year lock up and then three years, you know, one over 48 every month. Celestia has a two year lock up. So one year cliff from the token launch, which was December. And then, um, and then, you know, another half uh, over the next 12 months. That's a relatively short lock up. So I don't know where the token price will be in two years when everybody gets unlocked. I'm glad you brought this up because this was another heated discussion or series of heated discussions at Satoshi Roundtable. There was a great talk at the pool the, like the last day where people were talking about what is the right vesting schedule for your investors and your KOLs and your team. And should it involve cliffs? A lot of people said cliffs are, are just completely wrong and always are wrong. Sizes of unlocks. And another thing I've seen as an investor, even in the last three or four months, is very aggressive unlock schedules early. And even some founders coming in and saying, we believe that people are stopping to use protocols with long vesting schedules because it's continuous down pressure on the same token you're using to reward these people. And so we're seeing people move away from protocols that are have these grandfathered in vesting schedules that continue to punish the token versus I wanna get my tokens out on the market in four months, you know, um, what other people are saying that's insane. And the other ones are saying, no, I want the liquidity out there and I'll just launch at a lower valuation. These are interesting discussions. Um, because if you tell someone now you have a four year vesting schedule, they'll be like, well, Jesus, the bull market will be over by May 25, which I want to get your prediction <laughs> later. Um, what do you say to that? What are your thoughts on that? Because you've been investing for quite some time and I've seen a lot of variations lately. Mm, that's a difficult topic. I think. Sola did it well. We were early investors, seed. And uh, when they launched the token, they basically unlocked everybody. And because vesting schedules weren't even talked about it back in 18, no. were they? And, and actually we had a seed investor. As a seed investor, we had to agree for our 
token unlocks to just come at one point of time when the chain was launched. Everyone knew that it would be a big hit to the to the token. But, you know, we all said it's probably good for the chain because you get this big shakeup and then you get long-term holders. Rip the band-aid off. Yes, and of course at the beginning it hurts. So you have to have the self-confidence that you can basically sustain it. And maybe that's a good, you know, question to the teams, how self-confident they are in the real value proposition of their chain. Because if they are, then they can sustain an earthquake. If they are not, then, you know, then they just release a little bit of the tokens because the demand will pull the prices up. And so I'm much more in favor of uh, shorter lockups for investors. I think the team should be locked up so that they are not selling just like, you know, when you do, when you invest in, in an equity. And so I think the team should be, you know, three, four year rest, but I think all the investors should uh, unlock immediately. And then, you know, 100% unlock on, on, on TGE. On, of the investors, then of course you have, you know, you get the pie 100% is always split a bit differently. So you have a large part in the treasury that you kind of use to uh, motivate the users of your network and also to basically pay, for example, the salaries of your developers. So that of course, like, should like, doesn't have to be unlocked because like foundation managing it, why should they sell it? And then you have you basically all the advisors and investment and investors who probably, so the advisors you, you do, the advisors you do want to keep them locked, the investors you do not want, the team you do. So you have to think differently about the different, uh, the different stakeholders. So one of the discussions led on to there should be a dynamic schedule. Whereas if you dump on TGE, then you only get 25% of your tokens. But if you hold longer, you can have 100% of your tokens. And I, I mean, I think it's too early to say, maybe there is some type of a dynamic model that will optimize for company health, which is ultimately what that company wants if they're issuing tokens. Do you think that could be something in the future? Like, I think we should not innovate business models. I think simplicity is key. And I would, I think the more I think about it, the more I'm in favor of the investors just being unlocked immediately. Again, I'm thinking of another movie, New Jack City. You change the product, you change the marketing strategy. Yeah. So, but Ken, we're still looking at this kind of an equity lens. Like, I might argue that, that this should be different because like you said, it's a very, you said earlier, this is such a rare thing that happens where you have a publicly traded asset of a very new company and the IPO model that would never happen. So yeah. maybe it does need something, but maybe that complicates it more. Yeah. I think as we mature as an industry, you can of course use also derivatives to like anchor your price. So you can just sell a forward and then, you know, you, you basically fix the price of the day for the day when the unlock happens. Of course, the cash out is on the day that unlock happens, but at today's price. So we can do, you know, Falcon X, Wintermute, they can already do derivatives like this on certain tokens on certain of course on those which have higher high volume like yeah. solana for example yeah as a derivatives trader i'm always thinking of that so you yeah. can sell forward your tokens and then you can lock in whatever price is that happening right now do you yeah. think to a certain uh, even right. on illiquid tokens oh. it just has to hedge it in the background but they have to be able to short things so there has to be enough liquidity yeah to... there has to be enough liquidity but okay. you know i think the so we are investors also in other funds we invested $50 million into 30 funds. So I think with $50 million invested, I think we are one of the largest like fund of funds out there in crypto. Out of the 30 funds, only three returned capital. 27 did not yet. And I think that these fund managers, they all realize how important it is. Not only TVPI, like total value to paid in capital, but also DPI, distributed to paid in capital. Because what people care LPs, what they care about, especially today, is cash. It's not, you know, the value on paper. And um, yes, the VCs, they can lock basically their upside using forwards. And, and so I think these trading desks, you know, whether it's Falcon X, Galaxy or the others, they have, a, they have a certain amount of demand coming from VCs to be able to lock in the price. Mm. Can you talk about the funds you invest in? Can you name names or tell how you do it? It's public information. It's, okay. it's on our website. 
And why, and why do that? Because, you know, you got a pretty full plate with what you do, or does this yeah. just complement everything you do? So I'd say at the beginning it was like most of our team is born in a communist country, so we have a bit lower self-confidence thinking like the Americans are rock stars. <laughs> so at the, the, the Americans always up there? Yeah. British anywhere near there, or is it? <laughs> no, I mean like the Western world okay. kind of, to, right. to simplify. And so at the beginning it was, yeah, like, these guys are rock stars, so let's invest a little bit, you know, into Pantera and Polychain and to see, you know, to learn something from them. And now I'm actually learning, you know, we are not as bad ourselves. And so we are, we are reducing the portion of fund of funds in our funds. So initially it was 30% of our capital we invested into other funds. Now it's, now it's 20%. Initially it was, um, you know, to big funds. Right now it's more to smaller funds who are very niche. So for example, we invested into 6529, which is the NFT uh, fund. We invested into Sfermion. It's a fund focused on social. We invested into um, Le Random. It's an NFT fund focused on only generative art. Uh, we invested into DBA. It's a fine fund in New York focused on just very deep research. And so you cannot do everything. This world has become just so complex. Previous cycles we had 2013 was only Bitcoin. You know, 2016, 17 was Ethereum and then some ICOs. Now the world has become so complex with DeFi, NFTs, the modular blockchains and DA and shared sequencers and uh, Deepin and uh, and Deepin. And, and so we are just, you know, investing into funds which have a very deep focus uh, in order for us to have basically wider shotgun. Because then to our investors, we say, we are your one-stop shop because with us, you invest into the whole ecosystem because we cover the white spots through the other funds. 1.2 billion from 6 million. I mean, yeah. are you happy with what you've done? That's, that's some pretty impressive progress for a bunch of guys from Prague. Oh, uh, never happy. <laughs> It's my personality, but I think you want to be the KKR. Yeah. A $10 billion fund more. Like I, my dream as someone born in a communist country would be to run a publicly traded company. So I hope one day we'll be able to maybe, you know, do an IPO, maybe a bit like Galaxy or, um, yeah, or like KKR would be great. Um, and then three years later, you'll regret it. And buy it all back and maybe buy it again. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, you know, life is short and we could like fulfill our like dreams without challenging them. And so this is, this is one dream which I had since I was a kid. So what's the reaction you get from people? Cause first of all, the name Rockaway is, you know, not very traditional. So I'm kind of curious where that comes from, but also, you know, your vibe is very non-traditional and yet you're, you know, it, with big numbers also rubbing elbows with the TradFi. And again, like I attended your dinner and you guys are very smart, very in tune with what's going on, like the latest information, like finger on the pulse of the market in all aspects. And, um, it was, but also not, not, not so degen, like you can speak finance as well. And I know you have a McKinsey background. Well, what's the reaction from people? Cause there's, there's no one like you out there. Is there? Um, I, I'm not aware. I think, yeah, there are some very technical funds like ours, like for example, Paradigm. A16Z as well, but um, I think like we have not accomplished our vision yet. I think there is much more to do. We are basically the plumbers in the background. Yeah, so we, you know, people speculate, but we provide the shovels and picks because we run the blockchains on our servers. We provide liquidity to DeFi protocols. And I think unlike at McKinsey, at McKinsey, you were able to make a decision using Excel and PowerPoint, looking at the balance sheet of the company. And I completely underestimated this in crypto. I think I thought in crypto would be the same, but you don't have PNL and you don't have balance sheet. You basically have to touch the iron and run the plumbing to be able to understand what's going on. And so I don't understand the VCs who are just, you know, a couple of people trying to, to see like where the narrative is coming from. I think you really have to read the data on chain to be able to make your decisions. Mm. Wow. Out of those companies you've invested in, you don't have to name names, but there was there something that you were kind of like surprised and impressed by? And were there was other times where you were just really not impressed with what you saw? I think it all boils down to founders. 
and um and uh, i i cannot name names but of course like every time we try to be smarter than the founder we lost money because because the founder knows best and i'm very impressed with founders who have determination and self-confidence the two two critical traits to just their willingness of being successful and they change the product and they iterate and at one point they find the product market fit and boom it goes yeah i can name for example blocks route blocks route uri is the ceo amazing guy um basically phd in networking like computer networking his idea was to scale blockchains through a faster block distribution didn't work as an idea now he's one of the top guys in the ethereum you know proof or builder separation and he's basically when you do a request on ethereum there is a high probability like he's running the search so he's taking all those requests in the mempool and basically building the block and then proposing the block to validators to subs- subscribe on chain how he pivoted into a business model which clearly makes sense and then i'm not impressed by some other founders who who don't have this vision and um or maybe you know just made too much money and then stopped working it just happens yeah like uh, there is a lot of money in this industry and i'm really impressed by and actually i am most impressed by the families and like the wives of the founders especially early stage because creative company fully consumes you like you cannot take off your brain at night thinking about your company when you are building it and you don't have money the first you know two, three, four, five years but you have your wife and you have your kids who you know need to support you otherwise your family life is in trouble and so i really respect those basically wives and those partners who are supportive of the entrepreneurs you know create for them the environment to be able to 100% allocate their focus do not create them additional problems like hey you need to bring uh, like whatever but i think like i'm mostly impressed by those families yes how do you judge a founder and does it take time and then do you meet the families before you invest no <laughs> <laughs> but maybe you just should search them with private detectives maybe we should but but it's more like can you tell right away the the family breaks up if the support is not there because the founder gets consumed and then the support is there and the family will endure yeah um i think like there are a couple of signals which tells you like what the what the founder has been driven in in his life and i think it's important to for example why combinator is saying all the successful founders have one common trait and it's they always had a hobby they were super focused on in addition to their school or in addition to their main job they were successful at two things this is a trait which shows you that if they can succeed at two things there is a high correlation they'll be successful also at a company because then they can manage a family and the company at the same time and so i'm often looking at like having personal discussion with the founders like what's driving them in their life you know describe to me what you've been doing you know since you were since you were in high school and then we try to have like a very personal discussion and and I'm able to sense kind of um, a little bit yeah and then also like how they behave so often we use in crypto currently to book their time and if i can book their saturday and their sunday like it means that they are super motivated i'm not sure it's good i tell them hey like make sure you have a good work life balance but it shows that they are all in one of my mentors once said um there is no work life balance there are work life choices and they have consequences yeah so does a successful startup have to be working 7 days a week i don't think so and i don't think it's healthy sometimes it is important but um look i struggle with it yeah like um i'm happy like my family is not here now because you know i work the whole weekend today's what today's monday so because i could and you know some of our companies from portfolio is now raising so i created their pitch deck because i enjoyed from making it live i just like powerpoint yeah mm-hmm. and so 
And so I struggle with that, but I think it's important to also have hobbies and some things you want to achieve also like outside of life. I would like to like fly planes. I'm doing my PPA license now. I would like to play ice hockey a bit more. I love music. So I go to Burning Man every year. I think it's important to have this fun or, or maybe another way how to answer this is like, for me, it's like it's bursts. So I have these moments where I work a lot. And then I have these moments where I don't work at all. This is what works for me. Okay. That's Burning Man once a year. <laughs> Not many others. Yeah, or sometimes, you know, just taking a month off and just traveling okay. with my family. I think the answer is, is that probably all most successful founders are doing some work seven days a week. Yeah. I think that's probably what ends up happening. Yeah. Probably some of them have some really good hobbies that can complement and give them some downtime and then they can get back. And their work probably gives them energy at the end of the day. Yeah. I love working. I work all weekend. I was always yeah. something I can do. Yeah. And I, and I really enjoy it. I see you're well prepared for this. Yeah. <laughs> and this is only a part of the, what I was doing. I jumped out of a plane on Saturday. <laughs> so, um, actually on the, on the hobbies yeah, or how you relax, I heard Elon Musk is playing video games when he's stressed. I love playing video games. Okay. It's also like, it's also a way how to like Call of Duty on PlayStation 5, it's amazing way how to just uh, relax your mind, I think. Yeah, because you need to get your mind off of work. Yeah. And like you said, a work for a founder, is it just absorbs everything yeah. about their life. The only reason they're going to be good at it is if it absorbs their life. Yeah. And not many things can get their mind off work. Yeah. Um, and a game like that can yeah. actually give your brain. And I thought meditation, I, I heard meditation could help, but I'm just unable to control my brain now. Maybe later it will come. Maybe I'm just too young. And, um, but for me, it's those kind of like activities, which kind of like excite me where I forget about the work. And it's also, it's running is great. I have some good ideas during running. It's skiing, as I said, listening to great music, flying planes, playing ice hockey. With meditation, I would say, I think the biggest problem people like you have with meditation is that you think if you try to do 10 minutes of meditation and you're thinking about, you know, the liquid token fund and the eigen layer and this and that, <laughs> that you think you've failed and you haven't. A successful meditation is that you did it. It's not yeah. that you became the Buddha or you didn't have thoughts. Um, this is what Rick Rubin says. Rick Rubin has a great book out recently called uh, The Creative Act. Mm -hmm. You should really listen to it, it's really good. He's a famous producer of all these uh, great, great bands from the Chili Peppers to Jay-Z. And um, he's right, you shouldn't judge your meditation because even people like Rick have meditations where they think about the cat food they gotta buy and all this stuff. And I try not to judge mine, but I make sure I get it in. And so just completing it is a successful meditation. And I think a lot of people quit because they're like, oh, I can't do it. But you can do it for five minutes. Mm -hmm. And I think it really helps gain perspective. Um, and then it gives you at least once or twice a day where you're trying to... You do it daily, yeah? Yeah, every day. And I've been, mm -hmm. dialing, I've been doing a walking meditation now every day for like an hour. Mm -hmm. Where, trust me, an hour of my time is really valuable. Yeah. But it, for me, it pays the biggest ROI in a walking meditation. And you really just try to concentrate on your breathing and you like forget about everything? Or... When I started with Transcendental Meditation, this is the reason I have this show, because I was working in the city, I was a broker at ICAP PLC, you know, slinging those credit derivatives between Goldman and JP Morgan, making a ton of money and uh, had all the goodies. And at night I was alone, no family, no friends. I was drinking myself to death. Mm -hmm. Very typical city experience. Yeah. So I was training martial arts at the time. That was the good thing. And I took a meditation course, Transcendental Meditation, 20 minutes twice a day. They give you a mantra. It's a word that you just repeat in your head. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm telling you, Victor, three weeks later, I walked in and quit my job oh, wow. because I realized that the money, I thought the money was making me happy and the money would make me happy, but it wasn't. Yeah. So that gave me some perspective. For the first time in my life, I, I just looked at myself and I thought, what are you doing? This is stupid. And so the meditation gives me a little bit it gives me a way to observe Brian. And that way, if I'm struck with anger or depression or anything like that, I can be like, okay, why are we angry? Yeah. You don't have to act on the anger. And sometimes I act on it. It's not, what are you angry? Okay, maybe uh, maybe just take a break. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's because of this. Maybe it's because of that. We, we don't have to do that. We don't have to act that way. Okay. So it just gives me a little more perspective. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and I'm sure it will control you. your ego, yeah? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it does. It helps control your ego. Okay. And I mean, you talk about this because it's, you're in a tricky business because you have to be, you have to control your ego because you have to be, you know, you want a founder or even what you do, you want to be so fanatic about the ecosystem, you believe in it deeply in your heart, but you also have to be 
to know when you're wrong. Yeah. Well, venture capital is not a good way how to make money, I think. And also it's a very tricky way how to be happy. So let me explain, yeah? So look at Forbes Top 100. There is zero venture capital investors there because, and I think that's for two reasons. Number one is you give 80% of the money you make to your LPs. You keep 20. 80% is a lot, yeah? 80% is a lot of money. And so it's a, there is a business business model problem or issue, although I'm in favor of the business model. I think it makes sense. It's just, you are just giving away a lot of the value that you create. And second thing is, why you are constantly unhappy if you are driven by your ego is because you either missed a deal which made money or you didn't put enough money into a deal which made money. So in your mindset, you could be constantly just hurting yourself to be constantly unhappy. And so this is because your ego is always unhappy, always wants to have more. But, you know, the solution to it is, is for me just to think about the founders and the technology and the fact that, you know, it's freedom. And then you kind of, it's, it's all about the vision, I think, and why you are doing this. And then you settle and you say, it's actually okay. Yeah, I love what I'm doing. Money is not important. <laughs> so important. Yeah. So important. I guess I want to close on this aspect of freedom because until you were 12 years old, you were living in a communist country. And, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, my uh, my partner uh, came from Bulgaria as well. And, and, and when you talk to them, as someone from America, you realize that, like, down to your DNA, it's a fundamentally completely different way of looking at the world. You know, I used to, you know, make money by mowing people's lawns and anybody could start a business. You could start a lemonade stand. And a lot of these countries, you know, like private enterprise was just not possible. And so you're coming... You're, you're kind of playing with a with a stacked deck to a certain extent. You're trying to compete in a capitalist world, whereas you were brought up for most of your life. And again, your elders never in their life would have experienced capitalism. What was that like for you? And what does it continue to be like? Maybe yeah. it's a struggle being 12 until everything opened up and checked yeah. public. Well, it com like it defined my life basically. And, um, and, and, you know, I say like ever since I was 12, since the iron wall curtain went down for me the world just opened and is now a box of chocolate and then i just want to try everything i don't judge i just want to try for example went to high school when i was 17 with like an exchange program i went to lewisburg in pennsylvania lewisburg area high school and there you had the football players american football every friday dressed in their like american football jerseys walking inside the school and all the most beautiful girls were running after them. And you know, I could have been consumed by my ego and saying, why since I was a five years old, nobody was teaching me to play American football because I could have been, you know, wearing this jersey and be with these guys and have the most beautiful girls. But I was just stepping back and observing. It was like, the world is amazing. Like every culture is different. And if you're just observing, you actually get peaceful. But if you are constantly driven by your ego, want to have that, then it just destroys you. They say comparison is the thief of happiness, right? Yeah. And so you've also said that until you've had your freedoms taken away from you, you don't appreciate them. And so I think you bring that appreciation of, wow, I have financial freedom. Wow, I have the, the freedom to build a business. Whereas some people were born with it and maybe don't recognize it. I mean, in America right now, my stepdaughter is at, in at Boston University. I mean, they openly try to tell each other that Marxism is the way. I'm sure you might, uh, you might love one of those discussions, you know? <laughs> and maybe it's because these kids have never experienced something like that. They, yeah. There are capitalist free markets that they're literally submersed in. Um, to them, they don't even recognize it, you know? Yeah. Well, people always want what they don't have. And so I think communism is a beautiful idea. It just cannot work because humans are made differently. But, but fundamentally, I think it's all about freedom and the fact that, you know, how much I actually appreciate not right now that, you know, can t I can take a plane, fly to London or fly to Dubai and, um, you know, work on the blockchain every day where it allows everybody from any country to have access to the same financial services. So actually 
life becomes fair because you know not everybody can tra- trade stocks on interactive brokers but anybody with a smartphone and internet connection can connect to one inch and do a transaction and so that's why like it connects my like heritage with uh, you know the future and, and and the freedom is the glue between the two I love it um, Victor if people want to learn more about Rockaway what's the best way I guess they can be customers potentially you're looking at businesses to fund all those kinds of things well, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you yeah um, rockawayx.com or on Twitter and you know we are always growing so so reach out I cannot talk about our funds but you know you know where to find us why Rockaway because there is a beach uh, near San Francisco which is called Rockaway I know there is also one uh, in New York yeah but that's where you know we were inspired by that beach and said hey like also although we are Central European we can make like big venture capital firms which would compete with the San Francisco based ones and we called it Rockaway I love it <laughs> Victor I could talk to you for hours but thanks for the time let's do this again sometime in the future all right thank you so much right so much Appreciate you. Thank you. And just want to thank Web3TV for having us. We'll see you next time on London Real.